I simply was uh, like many people who fell under the seductive influence of the real Frank William Abagdale Jr. I was very seduced by him from his book, just by the character, how he saw himself when he wrote the book about his adventures, his exploits in the world of being an imposter and check fraud and um, you know chicanery of all kinds. I was very interested that this young man um, came of age during a 21 month crime spree and a lot of a lot of which was very innocent and a lot of his, his success was because he was operating in a very innocent time the mid 1960s a time of tremendous innocence and trust you never locked your doors and you felt safe and I justified doing a movie about a sensational rogue in talking with Frank, you realize a couple things about him immediately. You realize that even though that he is one of the biggest bank robbers of all time, he really is genuinely a good person that was misguided and was young when all this stuff happened. It wasn't like he was a petty thief in the sense that he would take a wallet out of an old man's pocket or, you know, try to steal something from, you know, a mom and pop store or something like that. He would always go after the biggest corporations and it would never be a situation where he would steal from somebody personally. What Frank did in real life was he knew how to use camouflage, social camouflage, which was basically changing and switching occupations. He was a quick study. The real Frank probably had a dazzling IQ and was really, and also had a tremendous style. People like and trust Frank. When you meet Frank, you understand in a second, just meeting him, how he could sometimes pull the wool over your eyes and convince you that he was a doctor wanting to transfer to a different hospital, having forged all the medical certificates or how he was a lawyer uh, and had passed the bar in California but now needed to take the bar exam in Louisiana, how he taught high school, how he impersonated a Secret Service agent. He just had a presentational style that there was no question that the real Frank was everything he claimed to be. I would never have doubted that had I met Frank in, in a real life situation where he needed me to fall for his scam in order for him to succeed. Even today, just meeting him and knowing him, he can sell me eight days of the week anytime he wants to. I had no idea what this man was going to be like, and he's, as you can see, he's a dapper, well-dressed, incredibly well-presented man who exudes a brand of confidence that I wish I had. The seminar that he put on for a bunch of bank security experts and, and law enforcement people could have been a one-man show on Broadway. I remember things he said, I remember details of scams that he read, I can remember the, the information that he was putting out on the slides. I've since read his book and have regaled people at dinner parties over and over again with this scam and that scam and, and in fact it, it actually empowered I think my work as Carl Hanratty to see what a smart, confident, brilliant, charismatic man he is, because now I can understand even more so the relationship between uh, Carl and Frank. Look, Frank, nobody's chasing you. I was raised uh, just north of New York City, uh, in Westchester County, New York, about 25 miles north of the city. My parents, after 22 years of marriage, one day decided to get a divorce. I had no idea what was going on. I remember driving up to the stone building that said family court, not really understanding what that meant. And I walked up to stand between my parents. And I remember that the judge never looked at me. The judge just said that my parents were getting a divorce, and I had to tell the court which parent I wanted to live with, my mother or my father. And I got very upset, started to cry, so I turned around and ran out of the courtroom. And the judge called for a 10 minute recess and by the time my parents got outside I was gone. So my mother never saw me for again about seven years. My father unfortunately never ever saw me again, ever. I took a few belongings from my home, packed them in a backpack and headed down to New York City to, to try and find a job to support myself. I was six foot tall. I've always had a little gray hair. My friends always said I looked in my 20s. So I decided to lie about my age. And in New York we had a driver's license back then was a IBM card, not a picture on it. So I altered my digit and my date of birth from 1948 to 1938. And that made me 10 years older. But sooner or later I realized I didn't have enough money to support myself. And one of the few things I had taken when I left home was a checkbook. I had a checking account for a couple of years for a couple of hundred dollars. When the $200 ran out, I just kept writing the check. Is it okay if I write you a check? And of course the check started to bounce. 
I knew the police were looking for me as a runaway, looking for me for the bad check. It was a t good time to start thinking about leaving New York. I was apprehensive about going to Chicago, Miami, and wondered if they would cash a New York check as quickly as they did on a New York license. And one day, 5 o'clock in the evening, walking up 42nd Street, pondering all of this, 16, I started to approach an old hotel called the Commodore Hotel, now the Grand Hyatt, and out stepped an Eastern Airline flight crew right in front of me, captain, co-pilot, flight engineer, about three or four flight attendants. And I watched them board their bags into the van and I thought to myself, what a perfect front. I mean, if I could pose as this pilot, I could fly all over the world for free. I could get just about anybody anywhere to cash a check for me. So I walked up the street a little further, the 42nd and Park, and when I went to cross over, I looked up and there was the 55 floors of the Pan Am building. Pan Am was the nation's flag carrier, the airline that flew around the world. I thought that'd be a perfect airline to use. So the next day I placed a phone call to the executive corporate offices of Pan Am and when the switchboard was ringing, I really had no idea what I was going to say. And when they answered, you know, Pan American Airlines, good morning, I said, yeah, I'd like to speak to somebody in the, um, somebody in the purchasing department. And they said, hold for purchasing. Clerk came on and said, yes, sir, maybe you can help me. My name's John Black. I'm a co-pilot with the company. I'm based in San Francisco. We flew a trip in here last night. I sent my uniform out through the hotel to have it dry clean. Now the hotel and the cleaners say they can't find it. Here I am with a flight in about four hours, no uniform. He said, well, don't you have a spare uniform? I said, yeah, back in San Francisco, but I'd never get it here in time for my flight. He said, you understand this would cost you the price of a new uniform? I said, yes. He said, I'll be right back. And he told me to go down to the well-built uniform company on Fifth Avenue. They were their supplier. They'd take care of me. I went down there and the guy fitted me out in the uniform with the three gold stripes on the arm and the black uniform and the gray hair. I certainly looked old enough to be the pilot. And when he's all done, I said, how much do I owe you? He said, the uniform's $286. I said, no problem, I'll write you a check. I said, no, we can't take any checks. I said, oh, I'll just pay you cash. No, we can't accept cash. You need to fill out this computer boxes and put your employee number on this card. Then we bill this back on the uniform allowance, come out of your next Pan Am paycheck. And I said, oh, that'd be great. So I don't know who paid for the uniform, but out the door I went. In New York, there were two airports, LaGuardia and Kennedy. I only went to LaGuardia because it was closer than Kennedy. I got out to LaGuardia and I started walking around the airport in the uniform, trying to figure out now that I had the uniform, how the hell do you get on these planes? So I got hungry about lunchtime and I walked in the luncheonette, sat down at the counter on the stool, and the TWA crew walked in. And the flight attendant sat down in a booth. Pilot sat down around the counter right next to me. And back before deregulation of the airlines, people just thought of themselves as one big family. They didn't hesitate a moment to talk to each other. And the captain kind of leaned over and said, hey, young man, how's Pan Am doing? Doing just fine, captain. Tell me, what's Pan Am doing out here at LaGuardia? Pan Am doesn't fly into LaGuardia. They only go into Kennedy. So I picked up on that right away. I said, yeah, we came into Kennedy. I'm over here just for a few hours. Matter of fact, I'm on my way back to Kennedy now. He said, well, tell me, young man, what type of equipment are you on? And I thought, what type of equipment am I on? The only equipment I was on was a stool. So I thought to myself, they must mean what type of equipment's on the plane. So I thought, well, they have the wings and they have the engine. They always had a sticker on the engine. So I said, yes, General Electric. Well, all three pilots kind of just stopped eating and leaned over. Captain said, oh, really, what do you fly, washing machines? And I knew I said the wrong thing, and out the door I went. Over the next two years, I literally flew all over the world for free, just by riding on other airlines and riding in the jump seat. The only reason I quit at 18 is the FBI issued a warrant uh, what we call a John Doe warrant, meaning the FBI didn't know my identity. But the warrant said that I was approximately 30 years old. I was 18, so I thought it was a good time to hang the uniform up, and that's when I moved to Atlanta, ended up becoming the doctor. I moved into a very swank singles complex called the Riverbend Apartments. And on the application for the lease, it said occupation. And I began to write down airline pilot, but the next question said employed by, supervisor's name, phone number. So I thought to myself, I'd have to come up with something that would be impossible to check out, something that would justify why I drove an expensive car, wore expensive clothes, but I didn't go to work every day. So I wrote down the word doctor. 
And next thing you know, I worked in the hospital. And of course, I was there under a temporary certificate, so I really was not allowed to diagnose, administer drugs, treat patients, but I did supervise the shift. The doctor I replaced resigned, didn't come back. They asked me to stay on, and what was supposed to be three or four days ended up almost being a year. And after a year, no one the wiser, I just resigned and left. I went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, because I heard the Attorney General's office was looking for lawyers, and I figured if you can be a doctor, you probably can be a lawyer. And Louisiana did not require a law degree to take the bar, so I was able to take the bar. They practice under the Napoleonic Criminal Code, a procedure, which they still do today, so you had to study the code in order to take the bar. I studied it, passed the bar, and I went to work for then Attorney General P.F. Grimion in the civil division of his court, where I tried civil cases for about a year. No one ever doubted for a second I was not a lawyer. I left there and went to teach school at Brigham Young uh, as a professor of sociology. It wasn't difficult, read one chapter ahead of my students, they never knew the difference. And of course, uh, you know, through all of this I was writing checks. You know, I knew that sooner or later they'd catch me, it was just a matter of time, but I was just prolonging being caught. I wrote about uh, two and a half million dollars worth of bad checks in 26 foreign countries, all 50 states before I was old enough to drink, before my 21st birthday. And um, like all criminals, sooner or later you get caught. And I was arrested in southern France on an Interpol warrant uh, that they were looking for me. An Air France stewardess recognized me from a wanted poster, reported to the authorities she had seen me in this little town, Montpellier, where I was living and I was taken into custody. And uh, 26 countries filed warrants for my arrest, but the French government said, wait a minute, he broke the law here, he wrote bad checks here. So before we give him to anybody else, he obviously has to be punished for what he did here. So I was convicted in a French court, sent to French prison. Uh, when my sentence was over, I was extradited to Sweden, convicted in a Swedish court, sent to Swedish prison. And when that sentence was over, I was returned to the United States where I was charged with interstate transportation of fraudulent checks. And a federal judge sentenced me to 12 years in federal prison. Served about four years in a federal prison outside of Washington, uh, D.C. When I was 26, the government decided to parole me on two conditions. One, that I go to Houston, Texas, where I had never been before, which is unusual as you're paroled back normally to where you're from and two, that I go to work helping the government deal with these crimes by educating law enforcement agencies about how to deal with these types of crimes of forgery and counterfeiting. And uh, I've done that for 25 years. Um, I still work today with the FBI, still teach at the FBI Academy, but of course over those 25 years I've built up my own consulting business. I've developed technology today that's found on just about every driver's license, car title, birth certificate. Uh, passport, currency around the world. Uh, 25 years ago I met my wife, uh, got married. Uh, that changed my life a lot, but then my wife and I had children and that changed my life completely. Uh, today, uh, the father of three sons. I just think that he was the victim of his own innocence, his own coming of age, and the privileges of youth. And I really believe that Frank was very strongly and negatively affected by the divorce of his mother and father. And he just happened to act out in a way that was so original, it was worth making a movie about. I'd like to cash this check here, and then I'd like to take you out for a steak dinner. <laughs> I would be lying to say that it wasn't fun. I would be lying to say that it, that it wasn't a, an incredible life to have lived. Um, I wouldn't want to do it again, that's the truth. But having lived it, uh, you know, it was quite an amazing thing to go through. And especially, you know, people ask me today, what was the most incredible thing you did? And the truth is, the most incredible thing I've done in my life is taken what was very negative, my past, and turned it into what I am today. I redesigned their new credentials for years. So really, it's not the five years of all the things I did, scamming people and posing as people, but the ability to have now taken all of that and made it into a business where I've made 10 times the money I made scamming people is what makes it really amazing.